if you have somebody who has a really keen eye and will be straight with you, that's a gift. That is such a gift. That is invaluable. If there is one thing that I would want every bodybuilder to give themselves as a Christmas present, it would be somebody in their lives who has a really good trained eye towards bodybuilding and can just give it to them straight so that they always know where they stand. In the last episode of The Drop Set, I talked about binge eating disorders and how they disproportionately impact bodybuilders versus the normal population. Today, it's more of the same, but we're going to talk about body dysmorphia and how it impacts bodybuilders at such a much higher level than it does the general population who still has an issue with it, to be clear. But for bodybuilders, it's different. Why is that? Where does it come from? How do we define it? How do we go about fixing it? Let's talk about all that and more on today's episode. This is the Drop Set 258. Let's hit it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Drop Set, episode 258. I am your host, Darren Starr. Thank you for joining me. Full-time coach, you can check out everything that I do at fivestarphysique.com if you want to read about coaching programs, workout programs, five-star digital for all of my online courses, such as Macro Boot Camp, which you can't really see because the microphone's in the way, uh, and Hypertrophy University, which is available now. So you can go there and check that out. Uh, To those watching on YouTube, thank you for joining me here. This video is a little less produced. The podcast is a little bit more free-flowing, a little less edited overall. To those of you listening out in podcast land, audio-only version, hey, thank you, as always, for joining me here. If you can um, leave a review or at least a rate on whatever app you're listening to. I would appreciate that tremendously. I get a lot of great feedback from people individually who reach out to me via social media, um, either through my Instagram at Darren underscore star or hit me up at the drop set podcast on Instagram. That is the social media channel specifically for this show. I get a lot of great feedback and I love that, but I would also, it would help so much more if you post that publicly (laughs) because otherwise this show is not going to grow and I really want to make this show grow. So I've been at it for eight years. This is episode 258. Holy crap. What are we talking about today? We're going to talk about body dysmorphia. So let's jump right into it, shall we? Uh, I think a lot of people have a good primer on what's involved when we talk about body dysmorphia, but let's go ahead and define it after a quick disclaimer here. Um, Much like the last episode where we talked about binge eating disorders, dealing with cravings, et cetera, it's worth noting I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist, which is somebody who could be useful for dealing with body dysmorphia. I'm not a registered dietitian or an eating disorder expert. I am a bodybuilding coach who's been doing this for a long time. I deal with it myself, and I have a lot of secondhand experience in helping other people deal with this as well. So that is my background. I do not want to overstate my qualifications for this. So um, that being said, firsthand experience counts for a lot, and helping a lot of other people battle with this as well, I think counts for a lot as well. Um, depending on the severity of which you might be dealing with this, though, you this might be a great starting point, and then you realize, like, holy crap, I should probably talk to a therapist or something like that. So if that's you, do it, absolutely. I think um, there is there used to be such a stigma attached to seeing a therapist. It's becoming less and less now, but some people still carry that with them. And I would just encourage you, if that's you, let go of that. Let go of that. I've worked with a therapist before. Absolutely. It was one of the best experiences of my life, made huge changes. So um, I cannot, I cannot recommend that strongly enough if you're somebody who could benefit from that. I will also say I worked with a therapist that was a terrible experience as well. You've got to connect with the right person as well. The first one was not right. Um, The second one was. So Um, now, Body dysmorphic disorder is the uh, the actual clinical name for this, or BDD. Um, the definition says it's it's fixation on a perceived flaw, which I would say is true. Yeah, that's the generally accepted definition. But for our purposes, as it relates to bodybuilding, um, I'm going to define it a little bit differently. I mean, that's still the general crux of what it will look like. But uh, I think we should feel free to paint outside the lines a little bit a little bit, and define this in terms that are more directly appropriate for us and what we're doing here. So body dysmorphia in bodybuilding, uh, it, it's like any kind of eating disorder, like binge eating, like we talked about. Bodybuilders suffer from this disproportionately compared to the rest of the population. So the studies show that it's like 0.7 to 2.4% of the general population. I couldn't find any figures in bodybuilding, but I would put it somewhere in the 30 to 60% range. Um, so, it, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? That's a dilemma that does have an answer for it. And I think here the issue is that it disproportionately impacts bodybuilders because 
bodybuilders tend to have body dysmorphia, which is why they get into bodybuilding in the first place. Because that perceived flaw is something that they're trying to fix through action. And then the problem is they can fix it. They can fix it to an astonishing degree and then not recognize that they've fixed it because then they will just shift their focus to some other flaw. Um, which I think that gets to the very nature of what bodybuilding is. It's identifying flaws in your physique and knowing that through work and discipline, you can correct those flaws. You can improve over time. The trick becomes you have to identify when you are fixing, uh, identifying and fixing some original flaw. And then you need to recognize also when you are moving the goalposts on yourself and give yourself credit like, man, my arms are small. Oh my God, uh, this is awful. And then you can then spend some time fixing that, growing your arms. And then suddenly it's like, God, my shoulders are so small now. It's like, well, yeah, because now your arms are probably dwarfing your shoulders. And so now they need to come up. It's just this game of constant leapfrog. Take a second to recognize you fix the first problem. That should give you confidence that you can fix the second problem going forward. So I think it's, it's good to just stop and recognize little victories when they do occur. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, BDD is often um, associated with OCD, social anxiety. That's in the general population. I don't necessarily know. I mean, you know, I would say I, <laughs> I, I have characteristics of both of those traits as well, especially social anxiety. I always joke that I'm a little OCD, but you've got to understand like OCD is a clinical disorder as well. And people who suffer from that on an extreme level have, are, can have, you know, a debilitating degree of suffering from that. Me, it's more about like, you know, I like things a certain way. <laughs> and if it's not that way, it's irritating, but it's not crippling to me. So uh, when I say I'm, I'm really OCD type A, it's kind of joking. It's a little tongue in cheek. There is some element of that, but, you know, there's a spectrum for this stuff. It's not a binary thing where you either have it or you don't. And I'm definitely on the, you know, more normal end of the spectrum. I, re I absolutely recognize that. I don't have any kind of serious issues with it. Social anxiety is a bigger one for me. Um, that, that is definitely an issue with me, but it has been long before I got into bodybuilding. As long as I can remember, I have always been incredibly anxious in social situations. I've talked about on here before where, you know, if I'm in the gym working out, um, I could be having an okay workout. I don't really sweat all that much typically, but as soon as somebody comes up and starts talking to me, that's when I start sweating because it's the anxiety of this conversation now. And so <laughs> more than once, somebody has commented like, well, you look like you're working really hard. I'll get back to you. I'll let you get back to it. I'm like, the only reason I'm sweating is because I'm talking to you, buddy. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with my workout. I promise you, absolutely nothing. It's just like dripping sweat uncontrollably, like sweating through my clothes kind of thing. So on the social anxiety side, yeah, I'm definitely on the more serious end of that spectrum, 100%. OCD, not so much. I think also just bodybuilders in general may or may not have a huge correlation to this just because we are, we are in this category for a different reason. Uh, so it, I, I would kind of argue that body dysmorphia and bodybuilding, I would define it as the inability to see yourself objectively. And going back to what I said before, also kind of an inability to give yourself credit for successes that you have achieved. And I think it's important to just step back and recognize when you have corrected something or when you're on the path to correcting something, when you see, you see incremental improvement, it's not like you're just going to wake up one day thinking, oh, you went to bed thinking you have small arms and you wake up the next day and like, boom, there they are. Oh, great. You need to open your eyes to uh, those small changes. And we'll talk about that more going forward. Um, it can be a persistent issue or this is something body dysmorphia that can rise and fall kind of acutely in specific phases. Like you might think, uh, you know, you're, you're the, the, B biggest way I would describe this is the grass is always greener syndrome. Like you're cutting, 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 getting really lean, looking kind of freaky, but you feel small. You're like, God, I just want to put some size back on. Oh my God. The cuts over, you put some size back on, you're a little softer. God, I just wish I could be lean. Right. I think this is an extension of body dysmorphia where it's just a lack of ability to be content with where you are in your journey. And so I will always encourage people to be accepting of where they are, whatever phase they're in, you're a little softer, you're a little leaner and smaller. Those are both good. If you want to make progress long term, you're going to have to embrace some of those extremes to some extent um, and just be comfortable with it.
Just be, allow yourself to be comfortable with it. it. It's maybe physically a little uncomfortable. Like right now, you know, being as of recording this 15 days out from a show, I'm a little uncomfortable, uh, physically uncomfortable. And uh, I definitely feel small. Um, this is a 2XL shirt, which typically I would wear. And now I feel like I'm swimming in it. Um, and so it, it kind of hurts the ego a little bit. But I also know like, you know, all of this is temporary. And the thing about bodybuilding and doing it well is that uh, these are all variables that you have the ability to control. And so while body dysmorphia is really prevalent in bodybuilding, also like with the correct knowledge, with some good guidance from a good coach, just know that you've got a plan of attack in place where you can fix these perceived weaknesses, these issues that you see with your physique. The trick then becomes recognizing when you've done that. So uh, it, it's good to know when you might be entering a phase of heightened dysmorphia. So uh, we'll talk more about strategies involving that soon. Um, but like when you start to embrace the extremes a little bit more, you know, get very lean, you're, you're growing, you're getting really big and a little softer. That's, I think, when you're probably going to be a little bit more predisposed towards having these feelings crop up. If you typically don't, um, if you're typically like, no, I'm fine, I'm good with it, it can start to creep in a little bit during those extreme phases. So just be real with yourself and have a good idea of where you fit big picture. Um, which can be a trick, as we'll talk about the perspective here is a real, real issue. So I would classify also, this is my definition, this is a Darren definition, there's two types of body dysmorphia, and I'm going to coin some terms here. There's inflationary body dysmorphia, and then there's degenerative body dysmorphia. So inflationary is where you see yourself as being something way bigger and better than you are. Uh, this is not common. But, you know, we've all seen the picture of that guy who gets up on stage, who doesn't look like he's ever been in the gym, didn't get a spray tan, didn't diet, and he's next to some competitors who look like they actually prepped for a show and he just looks completely out of place. Like, if he's confident up there, that's inflationary body dysmorphia. That, that's, that's thinking you got it when you don't. Um, you know, the 140-pound guy who sees himself as Mr. Olympia, that would be, you know, inflationary body dysmorphia. So, uh and I talk with people like this pretty commonly who, uh, you know, they're looking for a coach. They reach out to me. They send me their photos. They're, th they're like, I think I've got, I've got pro caliber genetics here. I'm like, no, you absolutely don't. That doesn't mean you can't earn a pro card, but it's not going to be through genetics. It's going to be through hard work <laughs> and a lot more of it than somebody with good genetics would have to put in to be clear. So, uh, and I will tell people that, like I will burst some bubbles. I always do it kindly. I, I have a pretty good gift with words. Um, I can put that into a way that, uh, you know, I'm not looking to break anybody down or destroy anybody, but I do want you to have a reality check for sure. Just like I would want somebody to do the same for me. If I, if I came and thinking I was all that and like, no, you ain't buddy. Okay, cool. It's good to know where you sit. Um, and then degenerative body dysmorphia, this works the opposite, where you are much better than you perceive yourself to be. This is really uh, the, the more common thing, I think, in bodybuilding. So seeing yourself as inferior when compared against reality or the, or the way that other people might experience your physique. So the issue here is that <laughs> you, you can't really know what other people are experiencing. We'll get to that shortly. So I'm definitely much more in the degenerative camp here. Um, but at the tail end of a cut, I have in the past, and so I'm trying to correct this right now, um, I'll get a little overconfident. Like I start to see some lines show up, some definition that hasn't shown up before. I'm like, oh, I got this. And then you get up on stage and you're like, oh, fuck, no, I don't got this. I'm getting my ass kicked up here. I'm not ready. I've, I've had that happen before. Um, that might not have so much to do with body dysmorphia as it does about just getting kind of caught up in the moment um, and getting a little like a little too excited, a little too worked up. Like today, I was doing legs um, with uh, with Sam, my trainer at the gym, and uh, just doing a little a little flexing uh, in between sets. And I was thinking, like, I mean, I don't think I've seen my legs looking like this before. Like, am I on high? Am I on drugs right now? And she's like, no, your legs look really good. I'm like, okay, well, there's some confirmation. Maybe she's just being nice. I don't know. Um, but th I felt like they looked pretty good. Um, like I could see, you know, in a side pose, I kind of squatted down a little bit. I could see all the individual fibers twitching under the skin. I'm like, this is leaner than I've been before. This looks good. So, um, you know, things, there's some good fullness and separation. So I got to check myself though. I'm like, okay, I've been down this road before. Is this good enough? And there's only one way to know. It's like, let's kick ass on the last 15 days of this cut and see where I stand up on stage. And that's the thing. You never know until it's too late to fix anything about it. 
unless you're doing multiple shows, in which case then you can you can make some adjustments between the first and second or the second and third show. So uh, yeah, it might not have so much to do with body dysmorphia, but it is still like it's that lack of ability to see yourself objectively. One of the um, quotes that I often see um, leading up into a pro show where uh, guys or, or girls who are competing in that show are posting their picks. One thing to keep in mind is that everybody looks like Mr. or Miss Olympia when they're posting their own picks on social media. It's how do you look when you get up on stage and you're compared against everybody else that really matters. So the real rub, and I went ahead and trademarked this as well, is it, it the body dysmorphia is a, a difference between your perception and then reality. Reality we can also define as being the perception of others. The problem is you just there's no way to know what other people see. If you have somebody who has a really keen eye and will be straight with you, that's a gift. That is such a gift. That is invaluable. If there is one thing that I would want every bodybuilder to give themselves as a Christmas present, it would be somebody in their lives who has a really good trained eye towards bodybuilding and can just give it to them straight so that they always know where they stand. The problem is most of us don't have that. Um, we are surrounded by people who really don't have a trained eye. Like if you're the biggest guy or girl in your group, um, then the other people around you probably don't have that same that same kind of an eye, right? If you surround yourself with non-competitors, that would be me right here. There's nobody in my circle that can give me any meaningful feedback on where I stand. So, and also, you know, currently I don't have a coach, so I'm completely on my own on an island, which means that if I go into this show that I have in 15 days and I do reasonably well, like, let me tell you, there's going to be a party to end all parties after that one because that will be mission accomplished on the highest order. Do I expect that to happen? Not really. I'm going to do this with pretty reasonable expectations. But also, if I beat my previous performance, then that's what really matters here, which is the last point on this slide here. Uh, it, it's about you versus you for most of us. Now, where that changes is if you're at the highest level of the sport where there's money on the line, then suddenly it's not really about you versus you. It's you about you versus everybody else on the stage. But otherwise, can you beat what you've done before? Well, right now, I already know with two weeks left to go, I have beat what I brought to the stage before and by a mile like pretty, pretty easily. So ultimately what happens at the show doesn't really matter all that much to me. Um, and I can say that with full clarity of thought and full transparency. The show day for me is just about putting a rubber stamp on it and finishing this prep with an event that honestly will be a giant pain in my ass, which I would almost kind of rather not do, but I'm going to do it. You know, show day has never been a big thing for me, but it is like, putting the seal of approval on the end of a prep and saying, okay, and after all that, this is where we ended up. We've got the photos, we've got some video from stage, we've got a placing so I can know like big picture where I stand. What do those results mean to me? Not too much, to be honest with you. I'm not going to get too excited. Last show I did didn't place well, didn't get too upset about that. So, um, you know, you got to be kind of even keel about it. Like what really matters? Ultimately, it's you versus you, which is the cliche, but it's also just incredibly true. And uh, it's just good to keep that in mind. So uh, if you are a competitor, those photos from the stage can help tremendously because those are your direct comparisons. So that is kind of the way to cut through body dysmorphia to some degree is look at how you look on stage. You know, you're out of the moment. It's always different when you look at yourself in a mirror versus when you look at a photo of yourself. And usually when you look at a photo of yourself or video, um, you will see yourself in a less flattering way than um, what you see with your eye if you're looking in the mirror, for example. And that's just because most of us are pretty shitty photographers and videographers, and we can't really capture light um, with a camera the way that you can. Like, you know, you can very easily position yourself in a bathroom or something using the mirror to where it's like, hey, there we go, cool. But then capturing that in a photo or in video is a, is a different skill entirely. I'm pretty good at the first, pretty terrible at the second. So therefore, I don't really end up with a lot of video that looks good. So um, just something to keep in mind. And so when you are looking at yourself uh, in a lineup on stage, and you're looking at those photos, everybody's in the same lighting. And so that's a pretty good indicator of where you sit. Now, what you don't know is, is that a strong class or is it a weak class? Because you could look pretty good, but if you're in a stacked class, then you still might be, you know, the, the weakest looking physique on stage at that point. It's not necessarily a problem though. So, um, so, but 
you, you just don't know what other people see. So if you can't surround yourself with that magical unicorn of a human being who has a really well-trained eye towards bodybuilding and can be completely and totally honest with you, um, there's got to be a lot of trust involved in that interaction. Um, without that, you do have to rely on some guesswork to some extent. So uh, it, it's a problem that doesn't have a real solution. You know, you can't, uh, that third person objective perspective is not something that can easily be learned over time. So um, the more you do it, you can start to get a sense of where you sit big picture. Like again, for competitors, you do enough shows, you place in consistently this range, it's improving over time, you know your physique is improving, you can go back and look at photos, you can make those, you can kind of learn it over time, it's just certainly not a fast progress by any stretch of the imagination. So where does body dysmorphia come from? This is the big question here. And I will say that with most of our problems in society today, it isn't caused by, but it is exacerbated by social media. Absolutely. So the comparison syndrome, um, you're constantly surrounding yourself um, with images and videos of some of the best bodybuilders in the world who curate specifically what they want you to see of them. And they're good at that. The, the pros are good at working the angles. They're good at making the magic happen, which is great for making you feel shitty about yourself and how you look. Because chances are, you, you probably don't have a pro caliber physique. And if you don't, first of all, it's not a problem. Keep working towards it. It's a grind, as it is for everybody. Um, but also, uh, you, you are seeing an idealized version of that at the highest level. Th those are the people that we follow on social media, right? Like most of us aren't following a whole bunch of other amateur competitors at our level, unless they're your friends. Um, but also you kind of know where you rank against your friends. You kind of know how you stack up against them. So you've got to watch who you are putting yourself into the same bucket as. And then I would say, as always, compare against yourself and um, don't rely, certainly not heavily, on comparison against other people who are clearly like, you know, I, and I, I will put myself in this category as well. Like I'm an NPC amateur bodybuilder. I do not want to put myself in a bucket where I'm comparing myself against classic physique guys because I am always going to come out the loser in that comparison. There's no value in that for me, right? Um, unless you can be a little bit more aspirational in how you approach it, which is great, meaning like, wow, that guy or girl looks great. And instead of feeling like, why don't I look like that? I look like shit. Think like, God, that's something to work towards. And I think realistically, now that I think about it, that might be really the defining characteristic of having body dysmorphia or not. When you see something like that, um, do you retreat in yourself and get down? Or does it make you kind of grow up outside of yourself and want to push towards that? Um, the body dysmorphic individual that would be me, is going to shrink back down into themselves. And I always do that. Uh, that's, that's really, that's my personality type. That's my character trait. So I'm trying to overcome it, but it's hard. Um, and right now in prep, um, I've really had to, you know, I, I kind of stay in a, a pretty enclosed rabbit hole. And during prep, that rabbit hole has got like a lock on the door. I'm not letting anybody in. <laughs> Just because uh, I feel like things are in kind of a fragile state mentally and emotionally being 15 days out. So I've really got to carefully curate what shows up in my feed. So um, there's some additional issues. And we're going to talk more about solutions here in a second. Um, this would be somebody who is maybe chasing a specific aesthetic target. Like, you know, I want to be lean, I want to be full, et cetera. The issue with that is that these things are very transient states. Um, all of it is in bodybuilding, realistically. Like, whether you lean out, whether you bulk up, none of that's permanent. You know, it's, it's all going to be, you know, it's, it's there in the moment, and then it can be gone within a day or a month, um, depending on what we're looking for. So, um, I've worked with people who want to get to a certain aesthetic and then maintain that. And it's just good to know like um, what level of work is going to be required to maintain that. And you can do it for a couple of weeks. Can you do it long? Can you do it for six months if you want to sustain kind of that sweet spot? How big of a range do you give yourself for that sweet spot as, start, as far as like, you know, I want to stay 8% body fat with fullness, uh, with muscular fullness. So I get great pumps. I'm like, that is a really, really hard place to stay in for most people. If you're like, well, I want to be 10 to 15% body fat and be pretty full and perform well. Okay, that's more reasonable. You know, you're giving yourself a range to play with there. We can kind of estimate that visually and call it good. Um, so 
tracking down uh, again, chasing a goal like that is going to be pretty transient. Um, unless you give yourself a, a wider range to work with fixation on problem areas. We kind of touched on this already. The the thing is like your problem areas are problem areas for a reason. And it's be, just because genetically or perhaps through some technique issues, they just are, are slower to respond. Um, in terms of muscle growth, it could be the way that you work that muscle. Maybe you're working through an injury like, oh, my legs are small, but you know, I tore my meniscus three times. So guess what? Your legs are probably going to remain small and you can make some incremental improvements there, but you're going to have to be okay with the fact that you're probably not going to be Tom Platts. And that's okay. That's okay. Nobody is except for him. Uh, so those problem areas are problematic for a reason. If you're trying to lean out in a certain area, that area is difficult to lean out for a reason, typically because it's going to be one of the last that leans out on you and you don't have any control over that. People are like, oh, my midsection, my lower abs. I'm like, yeah, there's nothing. No, don't do more crunches. You're wasting your fucking time. Don't do that. You just have to get leaner. And that's going to be probably the last place that it goes from. And so this is another chicken or the egg debate, you know, is that a problem area because we fixate on it or do we fixate on it because it's a problem area? Usually, um, my, my theory on that, and I think probably both of these things are true to some extent, but I think more often um, it becomes a fixation just because it is genetically a problem area and you're looking for something that matches something that you've seen in somebody else, you're not seeing it and so therefore you want it more even though it's genetically like that's your trouble spot. Uh, the other thing would be a perceived lack of progress, um, which can be another issue um, that kind of contributes towards body dysmorphia. This might be legit. So um, just because some people can absolutely put in reasonable, decent work and not really make a lot of progress. So um, we need, just need some metrics in place to track that so that we know if that's a legit problem or not. So what do we do about it? The, the first thing that I would tell you, just because I think a lot of this comes from social media, is to carefully cultivate your social media landscape. And what I would do is dedicate five minutes a day to scrolling through your feed. Yes, five minutes and only five minutes. Um, I spend about five minutes per day now on social media, period. And that includes times when I post on days when I actually put something up there. I respond to messages really quick. I don't really scroll much of anything. If anybody tags me in something, I will see it. But otherwise, it's a great chance I'm going to miss it. Um, so what I, what I would strongly encourage you to do is spend five minutes browsing through your feed. You see a post, something bodybuilding related, you know, clearly... If you're looking at a lot of dog and cat videos, great. More of that is never a problem. Uh, but you're scrolling through, oh, here's a bodybuilder. What's your immediate reaction? If your immediate reaction is something like, fuck, I can never do that, unfollow that person. Like you want to you wanna focus on fixing that issue over time, but immediately right now, let's just eliminate the threat. <laughs> You know, what we, what we want to do is develop a uh, response that's more positive overall, but it's hard to do that when you're constantly inundated with things that generate a negative response. Um, I, what I would do is immediately uh, just start unfollowing people, like anybody that gives you that negative response, unless it's me. If it's me, please don't unfollow me. Um or, you know, if it is, tell me and let me know just because I would like to know. Like, does anybody have a negative response to anything that I put out? I'd be curious to know. I mean, I doubt it because I ain't all that in a bag of chips. Uh, but, uh, you know, everybody's different. So, uh, but just a, a quick gut check. What's your immediate feeling as soon as you see a post from person X? If it's like, wow, that's awesome. Great, great. You're probably in better shape, big picture, when it comes to body dysmorphia anyway, just based on that response. If it's more negative, if it's like, God, I can never fucking do that, then unfollow that person. Eliminate the threat. You know, de-escalate your threat level. <laughs> that's, the, that's the first thing that we want to do. That's absolutely critical here. Um, just because you can't be inundated with this stuff constantly and expect to make progress towards solving the issue. So the first thing to do is stop allowing yourself to be bombarded by all of these negative immediate thoughts from all these things that you're seeing. Um, take regular progress photos and compare against archive photos, which means keep these, store these in a folder on your computer um, uh, or on your phone, I guess. Um, Taking at a, a similar time, like, hey, these are my photos from March of last last year. How are we doing here compared to that? These are the photos from, you know, I'm, I'm 175 right now. I bulked up to 200 and I'm back down to 177. Well, how does that look from, you know, 175 last year? 
or whatever, whatever it is like compare against those. And so what I would do personally is, uh, I store everything on my computer and every time I take progress pics, the photos for that particular day go in a folder and the folder is named by the date. So if I took photos today, it would be 2024, 05, 24, your 2024, May 24th. And then I would put my weight on that as well so that I know like, okay, May 24th, I was 209 or whatever it was, 209.6 today. So then you know, okay, cool. And you can tell at a glance, like as you're looking through those folders, oh, here, here's some good ones. This was back when I was at this weight. This was 18 months ago. Let me look at those. If you don't have those things easily cataloged where you can thumb through them quickly like that, though, it's going to be hard. So set yourself up to make that a little bit of an easier process. Um, focus on incremental improvement, improvement of self. So rather than saying, like, I got to fix my arms. My arms are too small. Let's set some smaller goals there. Like, let's take some measurements. And let's focus on just getting that number up over time. And I would take two measurements. I would take a cold measurement and a pumped measurement. Um, and then make sure you're feeding yourself enough so that you can see those improvements as well. Make sure you're training hard enough to justify, you know, one thing that I cover in Hypertrophy University, and I say this a few times in that course, is that your body really doesn't want to grow. It would really rather not have to build muscle because building muscle is hard, which means if it's going to, you've got to give it a good reason to, like a really good stimulus, really hard training, and then enough resources, food, rest, recovery, in order to make that happen. So uh, I, I definitely like make sure that you're hitting the mark on all those, but focus on, you know, take some measurements and just focus on tracking those over time. And keep in mind, it is a long game. So I would track those measurements on like, you know, at most an every two week interval, maybe every month would be good as well. Um, and then always continue to focus on why you're doing this. What are you hoping to get out of it? If what you're hoping to get out of it is some kind of self-actualization, you know, it's probably not going to happen. If, if what you're trying to get out of it is like, well, I want to build the best physique I possibly can. Well, every day is a step towards that. And what we want to do are eliminate the things that make it a negative experience. I can't put it any more simply than that. The biggest thing also would just be, as, as I talk about a lot, is just to enjoy the process of bodybuilding. If you don't, why are you doing this? You just have to enjoy it. When you do enjoy it, it's not to say that all this stuff goes away, but this stuff, this noise, this body dysmorphia stuff, the eating problems, etc., those all become more manageable because you're focused on a specific goal. You're focused on doing this for that goal, but also you're, you've chosen that goal because these are things that you enjoy doing. And if you enjoy doing it, then suddenly the challenges you kind of accept um, as just kind of being in the road. And it, it becomes much less of a problem long term. So uh, in closing, <laughs> uh, basically like body dysmorphia is one of those things like I feel very strongly about this just because of how much I've dealt with it myself, how much I feel it holds me back. Um, a lot of the mental struggles that I've had with it, like I've, I've often told people um, like I'm, I'm very, very uh, vocal about this. I tell people often like, it, this is hard. If I was not a full-time professional bodybuilding coach, I probably would have quit bodybuilding 20 times by now. Um, but I couldn't because I have to keep doing it just because it's my career. I didn't have a choice to quit. If I, if I had that choice, if that was an option, I would have taken that exit ramp many times. But because I didn't have that option, I stuck with it. And so I continue to improve and not just physically, but also mentally, like I'm more okay with it. Like I haven't had one of those exit ramp moments in quite a while, um, except for last week, <laughs> just because I, it was travel. My prep was unraveling. My family has significant health issues going on. There was just so much stress. And I just had one of those, like, I can't fucking do this right now moments. Um, but I got over it. So, and it wasn't really, I wasn't really seriously thinking about quitting, but really just like, I just need all this to stop for a couple of days. That'd be great. Did it? No. Um, but, uh, I got over it. So, uh, not having that exit ramp though means you continue to go. So what you need to do is just eliminate the exit ramp for yourself and find the things that are making you want to get off the interstate and address them. And so I would start with cultivating your social media feed. There's a lot of mental work that has to be done beyond that, but you can't do that mental work. You can't focus on meditation, improving your mindset, uh, you're trying to 
really like track your progress in a meaningful way and learn how to be objective about yourself over time if you're constantly bombarded by that noise of negativity that's coming in through social media. So I'm not saying that you get off social media entirely. I'm just saying cultivate your feed. Find out what that initial immediate gut response is when you see a post. And if it's negative, unfollow that person um, and just remove some of that negative stimulus so you give your brain a little bit of a chance to breathe. And once it can breathe, you can start to troubleshoot the issue. Whew. All right, quick break here. I just wanted to remind everybody, check out fivestarphysique.com. You can read about everything that I do there as far as coaching, have workout programs available, some merch, etc., all kinds of cool stuff. You can also check out fivestardigital.com where I have all of my online courses available. Right now, I'm working on Bikini Blueprint, Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, Men's Physique Blueprint, all kinds of stuff going on there. Those courses are going to start to become available June 1st of this year year. I'm working my tail off getting those things ready for prime time. You can actually go there right now, pre-order those courses if you want, or hit me up through Five Star Physique with any questions that you have on any of those courses. I'd be more than happy to help you out. All right, everybody. Welcome back to episode 258. Um, real quick, and a note about Hypertrophy University. That's my course that I have at Five Star Digital. Um, worth noting, this is a lecture course. Um, the first, I believe, 16 chapters of this course are all online right now. So the course officially launches June 1st. It's been available for pre-order for some time. Uh, so uh, I, I have it divided up into like freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years. Um, the senior year is the only thing left for me to record and edit and post. So, and that's all outlined and ready to go. Um, but for example, I think there's about five hours of video um, in the whole course so far that's available online. For example, there is a 40 minute um, chapter just about recovery, like how to know if you're recovered, how you can, how we would define that, what you can do about it if you're under recovered, um, how to know if you're under recovered. So I had to break that video up into two 20 minute parts actually. So, uh, lots in there. So if you're curious, you can check it out. Five star digital.com is where all my courses are. Hypertrophy university is on sale right now at a pre-order price. Um, that price will go up. Um, so jump on it now if you are interested. Uh, so we have a call in, I got, a, I got a voicemail, so we're going to listen to this. I have it queued up and ready to go. I have not listened to this yet, so I'm going to throw on yonder headphones, and I think I have my technology worked in such a way that you should hear this as soon as I push the button. And I've got some notes for taking here, so uh, let's uh, let's hit it. Let's go. Hi, Darren. This is Max from Fort Myers. I'm a long-time listener and huge fan of the show. Um, I wanted to ask your advice on cooking beef. I usually like my steak more on the well-done side. My uh, family jokes I like the cow killed twice. <laughs> and I've always wondered if this impacts the protein quality or nutritional quality of the meat as opposed to eating the steak more on the rare side. It's a question I've always had and always been curious about. And on the same topic, uh, do you incorporate jerky like beef jerky into your diet plans as like a protein snack? Uh, thanks for your advice and your great podcast. Appreciate it. All right, cool. Thank you, Max. Appreciate it. Um, always good to hear from a new voice. I don't think we have heard from Max before, so I love that. Um, so we're, there we go. Um, yeah, great question. So um, spoiler alert, no, to answer the question, but also allow me to backtrack for a little bit and judge you hardcore for a second. A well-done steak. Like I used to order a well-done steak as well when I was like 11. So, um, ooh, that was, that was a sick burn. No, I mean, honestly, here's the thing. Like I love a charred steak on the outside, but on the inside, I'm not a rare guy, but I'm a medium guy. Like a little bit of pink is pretty good. Um, I'm not hardcore when it comes like that, when it comes to that, you know, I did many, many years. I went to France and uh, ordered a steak tartare, which I think is just completely raw. If maybe just like a little cooked, um, it would not for me. No, thanks. Um, like I could see the appeal in it, but I just, I could not get over it. So <laughs> I could not get past the fact that this thing had not been cooked. Um, so uh, a little bit of judgment there, but at, at the same time to each their own. And as my wife likes to say, don't yuck my yum. Like if I like something, just let me like it. That's fine. All good there. So um, now that being said, ground beef, 
would be a different story. So if we're talking steak, um, I think there's a lot of personal preference in there. If we're talking ground beef, um, I will cook the ever-loving shit out of that and overdo it. So I have always thought that the process of cooking ground beef or ground turkey in a pan is just browning the meat. And maybe that's correct, but the way that my wife defines it is like, no, you cook it, and then you brown it, meaning like you let it get kind of charred and stick to the pan a little bit. It helps to have a high quality pan and you don't overdo it on the heat, um, but it makes the little charred bits on there and it like, it takes what would be a pretty good ground turkey or ground beef meal and it just elevates it. Like it's, again, it's personal preference, but I find when I overcook turkey or beef, that's when the magic happens. Also, if you have a little bit of seasoning in there, like I'll add some garlic powder, soy sauce is a good addition as well. Like that amplifies the effect to some extent. Um, that That's really, like it takes more time and it also takes a little bit of patience and it takes some self-control because to do that, you've got to get it mostly cooked and then you've got to walk away and let it sit for like 15 or 20 minutes and not touch it, not stir it. And just like compulsively, I feel like I have to, um, I have to stir this. I have to stir it. No, you don't just walk away and you'll start to hear it kind of like crisp and crackle a little bit. Cool. That's when you go ahead and turn it and then get more of the, whatever you're cooking into the bottom of that pan where the heat is and then let it sit there and then walk away. And again, give it 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, usually what I will do is I'm kind of impatient because I'm usually prepping this because I'm about to eat. So usually I will cook it normally, try and let it brown a little bit, um, serve it up. And then usually I'll leave the burner on for a little bit, like leave it on like, you know, medium low heat and walk away for like 45 minutes or something like that and come back and like it gets kind of magical at that point. Does it impact the protein quality? No. Um, what it can do, like the more it dries out, the more it will impact the cooked weight of it versus the raw weight, which can impact the macros, but it's not a quality thing. It's just like, you know, you're cooking some mass out of it. But at that point, like most of the water weight should probably be cooked out of it anyway. So I think, I think that impact is going to be pretty minuscule for sure. Um, but no, I mean, I would, I would recommend recommend it. As far as cooking a steak, it's the same kind of thing. Um, the mass of it will change just because there is more moisture. You know, there's more water, there's more blood um, in a steak that is rare. And so the more of that you cook out, the less mass you're going to be left with. Now, you have a hunk of meat and it's got a certain amount of protein in it. If you cook that hunk of meat, it's the same amount of protein, right? Like raw, it's eight ounces, it's 50 grams. Cooked, it's five ounces, it's 50 grams. Cool. Um, you just have to know like how you measure it, how you weigh it has to match how you're logging it. Like if you, if you take like, okay, I got this steak here, let me stick it on the scale. 7.8 ounces raw, cool. Open up your app, steak, whatever cut, sirloin, raw, 7.8 ounces, log it, cool. You cook that, however you cook it, those numbers are gonna be accurate. Now, if you would then say, for example, doing that differently, you would say, okay, I have this steak, um, or these steaks, I'm gonna take a few of them, I'm gonna cook them all at the same time, and then I'm gonna perform a sacrilegious act, and I'm gonna stick these in the fridge, and then I'm gonna pull one out and cut it up and then microwave that because I want it to be as tough and inedible as it possibly can be. Um, when you weigh that out, now you have to weigh the, you have to track the cooked weight of that protein source because you don't know what its raw weight is and was anymore. So um, just how you track something in a macro app has to match how you weigh it. Other than that, there's no difference in protein quality or quantity. So regarding jerky, big fan, big fan. So. Uh, I have in the past gone through phases where I've done this as a daily thing right now. Like I just finished a, a bout of a travel, you know, went back to Oregon to visit my family, two separate trips over the course of three weeks, two, two trips that were each a week long. Um, which by the way, when you're five weeks out from a show hard, do not recommend bad idea. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I relied on jerky a little bit, like as some as an airport snack. Um, it, it's good, you know. It's reasonably low fat. You'll have some trace carbs in there, but as far as high protein things that you can get that aren't a shake, if you just want to eat something, it's a, it's a great option. So it's going to be higher in sodium, which um, for a bodybuilder, if you if you measure that stuff and track it, it's not a big problem. Now, if you end up at seven, eight thousand milligrams of sodium a day, that could be an issue. Although maybe not depending on how hard you work, like your sodium needs may be that high. 
Um, you know, there's other factors that you want to measure as well. You want to check your blood work. You want to monitor your blood pressure regularly. Um, but a lot of high level bodybuilders will be good on six to 8,000 milligrams of sodium per day, um, with no adverse health effects. You just can't assume that you do need to track that stuff. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about the sodium content. Um, and honestly, as a convenience item, it can be great. Uh, the biggest downside, realistically, is the cost. It's just super expensive, but most protein sources are these days. So, you know, it's going to hit you one way or hit you the other way. So, uh, but yeah, I'm a big fan of jerky. And uh, it's, as far as like cooking proteins, no real issues there as long as you track it correctly. So great questions, Max. Appreciate that. Thanks for calling in and uh, good to have you as, as a listener too. So that's all I got, guys. That's been 258. So it's coming at you late this week. Just, you know, I got back yesterday afternoon. I had the goal of actually recording this podcast from a hotel room on Wednesday night, but I got stuck on a two hour long Zoom call with my family and... <laughs> And I had to be, I had to wake up at 2.30 in the morning to catch a shuttle to the airport. So that didn't happen. So I'm recording this on Friday. I will try and get this posted Friday as well so we can stay on the same Friday schedule. So I appreciate it. Um, follow me online at Darren underscore star or at the Drop Set Podcast, both of those on Instagram. Uh, leave a rating. Like the video if you're on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. Check out 5starphysique.com, 5stardigital.com. And I will catch you all back here for episode 259 next week. Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. 5starphysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.